to the Onside Kick. Ricky Whitmer here along with Dave Oster. Hey, guys. And Mark Weber. How's it going? And we're here to talk about the sports we love bringing to you each week. We're going to be talking about the Texans firing their head coach, Gary Kubiak, the world of baseball, Omer Sheik, former bull, could be traded. And then we're going to wrap everything up with the college football world. But, guys, the biggest thing in the NFL right now, today, Houston Texans fire Gary Kubiak. Mark, you called it. It makes no sense to me how a team that is as talented as the Houston Texans can be this bad on offense. You got Andre Johnson over there, who should be having the heroics like Calvin Johnson with Matthew Stafford, but no, he has Matt Schaub out there. And then you got Kubiak here, who's switching between Case Keenum and Matt Schaub anytime anyone throws an interception, yet, I don't know, uh... Schaub kind of had a streak going for games where he threw pick sixes, and it took a long time for him to get taken out. I'm glad this happened because this offense has always kind of been a joke. It's always uh, been pitiful. I wouldn't say they've always been a joke, but the one they thing— They have two talented the one players thing, they were lying And on one of them was injured this year. Once exactly. Arian Foster went down, this team was shot. And basically, you know, maybe Kubiak learned you shouldn't call draws on nearly every single third down. Or the screen pass. He loves the screen pass, too. He's got two options. I was going to say, their entire offense is based on Ryan draws and screen passes and sweeps. You know, so you take away your running back and it loses all threat. Who's who's going to buy on that draw? Uh, nobody. Nobody. I'm sorry, Ben Tate is a good running back, but he doesn't demand the same level of respect. No, not at all. I mean, he's a big guy who can take guys down, but he's not Arian Foster who, you know, when you're running these sweeps and everything— Arian Foster is the kind of guy who can do that. Ben Tate's a come at me and I'm going to knock you on the ground type of running back. It's a little different. See, and part of me, I mean, last season you have, and comparing last season to this season for the Texans, you have Matt Schaub who played, I'm going to say pretty well, but then got injured. And then TJ Yates comes in for the playoffs, plays well, but they get knocked out. This year they have Case Keenum replacing Schaub. And I think we're seeing, and this is why I'm going to say they went ahead and fired Kubiak, not only because they were bad, because this is what happens when you have a rookie quarterback most of the times in the NFL. Not everyone's going to come up roses like Aaron Rodgers. Exactly. And you also have the issue, too, where when Kubiak is switching back and forth, like, oh, Keenum threw an interception. I no consistency. In no consistency. You're not, the kid's not going to learn. He's not going to learn anything. He's just going to go, oh, if I mess up, I... I'm done. Yeah, he's coaching scared, and I think that was the biggest thing. Is As a head coach, once you lose that edge and that confidence in your calling of plays, your decision-making, you just lost it. It's over. Exactly. Uh, unfortunately for the Texans, though, I mean, it's nice that they're starting the search early because obviously they're going to start evaluating who they want to be their coach. But you got Wade Phillips coming in. Wade Phillips can win you some games. Yeah, but I mean— <laughs> I don't I say, know. And I'm, I say unfortunately because they might knock themselves out I'm of the Teddy not, Bridgewater contest. I'm not that favorable with the Wade Phil. Like, if you told me, like, hey, you know, if Wade Phillips does a good job, do you bring him on as head coach? I go, what did he do in Dallas? But Dallas is a different story well, because you have Jerry Jones to you. deal with. I'm just saying that Wade Phillips can win you games this season to where you're not number one overall. Anymore. Yeah, but do you want to be number one? Do you want yeah, to Davion Clowney or Teddy Bridgewater? You need a new quarterback. You, you absolutely do. They've already pretty much came out and said it. Schaub is done at the end of the year, and Case Keenum is not the quarterback of the future. So they really need to go uh, really, really go after a quarterback early in the draft. There are a lot of available quarterbacks coming out this year, so I don't know if it has to be Teddy Bridgewater or specifically. I'm just saying you go for the best guy. I but mean, yeah. obviously, I think Bridgewater kind of consensus way. the best. Yeah, they're available. Look, they need a quarterback of the. They need a franchise quarterback. They need that Andrew Luck. That you know. Who do you think it's going go to? If you were the Texans at number one at the end of the year, who are you taking number one overall? I mean, yeah, we have to wait for combines and stuff, but still, who do you think right Consensus now is number is one? Still Bridgewater. I personally disagree with it, but they probably will take him. Yeah, I think you got to go Bridgewater as well. I mean, there is that kind of hometown favorite uh, favoritism with Johnny Manziel, and obviously Johnny Manziel is a good quarterback. Yeah, he might have some of the personality issues that are going to concern scouts. I still think he's a solid option, but 
I mean, it's hard. It's like it's with Andrew Luck. I mean, there was the whole conversation with, do I go with RG three or do I go with Andrew Luck? And the consensus was, yeah, but just go with the best guy. But it's different because I don't think it's that different. Andrew, at the time before RG 3s injury, you no, could no, have no, taken I'm at either. The draft. Yeah, I know that was before the injury. You could have taken either one of those guys and had a guy that. Many, if not everyone, would well, consider a franchise yeah, quarterback. Yeah, that's what, that's what this situation that's is. That's different too. this year because there's, yeah, Bridge. I don't think Bridgewater's like no one's going to draft Bridgewater and be like he's the franchise guy. He's a guy that can become a quarterback, but he's not the franchise right from year one. You don't think Bridgewater's a franchise quarterback from day not one? from year one? He still needs to develop a little bit. He's going to be and drafted in a position he where he has the deci- to be. Does he have the de- decision making and? Everything football smarts to do so, yes. But right now, to me, size. He's just got to bulk up a little bit in the NFL, and then he'll be great. No, I think in this day and age, you have to go with your young quarterback right off the bat. There's no reason to actually have them sit in a situation like this. Oh, I'm not saying have him sit. I'm just saying he's not going to be that... Like, look at Andrew Luck, what he did with the Colts year one. Oh, yeah, so you impact-wise. Yeah, impact-wise, he's not going to be that franchise quarterback. Well, he's the franchise quarterback. He's just not going to be you a know, superstar he's not gonna, year yeah, one. He's not yeah. year one. He, he also wasn't compared to, I don't know, the greatest quarterbacks of all time coming out of college. Yeah. True. You I know. just think in this situation, I mean, whoever you are, uh, number one, whether it's uh, Jaguars, Texans, who knows, probably the Texans. Props to the Jaguars. Three wins in a row. Three. I mean, we're all ecstatic in this room. I think they're making a playoff push. They might just. I, they're probably mathematically eliminated, but I'm the only one that doesn't find four wins for the Jacksonville Jaguars this season. Yeah, that that's impressive. Four concern. overall, not just three in a row. Four overall. Yeah, that's four more than most thought they would win. But anyways, <laughs> four I'm, more than I thought they win. I'm just saying that I think for whoever is number one, even number two, you do have that Manziel Bridgewater. I think those are your top two guys, and I think you're in the same situation as the RG3 and Andrew Luck where people are saying either one is going to be good, either one can be a franchise quarterback, either one's going to win you games. Just go with the consensus. The consensus is Bridgewater first, and I think that's why he will get picked over Manziel. Okay, I'm going to throw something out there because I'm looking at two mock drafts. I'm looking at CBS. Both guys on CBS dot, CBSSports.com have Teddy Bridgewater. But if you look at fan-sided, they've got – Jadavion Clowney. What about the mock drafts that are going to put Jadavion Clowney? Because the Houston Texans need Clowney in their – well, we're assuming if it's going to stay the same. But it, the it's not. Is, you got is to – yeah, that's the thing is with the loss of a head coach, you know the next guy coming in is going to want to implement his own guys in the system. He wants to bring in his own assistant They coaches. might just go with the 3-4, though. I mean, they might stay the same. I mean, who knows? It's kind of a crap shoot See, right now. and that's one question – that I just thought of was what say they bring in a guy offensive minded and they keep Wade Phillips to be the defensive coordinator. Why wouldn't they just go, Hey Wade, let's use your system. Might as well. I mean, he's there. He knows the guys, the guys will respond to it fairly well. And the personnel there was picked to play in that system. Exactly. I think an issue uh, for the Texans when it comes to that type of a mock draft, taking Clowney, what is the Houston Texans problem? Offense. They don't have a quarterback that they can trust. Why would you draft a defensive end? Yeah, they pretty much came out and admitted that now that one of our that there is no quarterback on the team right now that they plan on having as the franchise quarterback. Not even TJ Yates. Not even TJ Yates. Poor Yates. I think and honestly, if we we're we were talking before we started recording about mm-hmm. teams possibly taking two quarterbacks, the Washington Redskins style. I think if any team in the draft takes two quarterbacks, it's the Houston Texans. Absolutely, I agree with you. Uh the thing that I'm kind of laughing about was in one of those uh, mock drafts that we had seen, it had them taking two quarterbacks in the first round. I think that the, might be... Yeah, the Cleveland uh, Browns yeah. managed to get Carr and Menzel. Yeah. I, I don't see the value there. I think you can still find... Like I said, this is a very deep quarterback draft as far as talent goes. There's going to be guys there in the third round who could absolutely shock people. I'm, I'm not guaranteeing Russell Wilson... But I'm saying there's going to be very talented players like there. Kirk Cousins, that yeah. kind of a thing. Where maybe third, fourth round, there could be a quarterback that is there. And there are, if you look at college, there are quarterbacks that will fit that. The guy that everyone seems to be talking about because he's 
from San Jose State, and who cares about San Jose State? But David fails. People are already calling him the Kirk Cousins of this year's draft, a guy that comes out to my mind is Blake Bortles, Central Florida, who knew about Central Florida until this year. Not many people, but he is just kind of paving the way. There will be those quarterbacks in the third and fourth round. And I'm just going to, you know, homer this one, Jordan Lynch. That He's going to be available in the fourth round. I kind of feel bad for Jordan Lynch because he is going to be, and I will say this, the first candidate, I believe, to finish second in the Heisman race, but might not be drafted. No, I— he, Might not be drafted. I would find it hard to believe that he doesn't get drafted— fourth fifth round might not be drafted i think he's a little undersized but he's very much the developmental type of quarterback i'm with you mark has all the abilities i like him quarterback or tight end or running back well he was and that's an interesting thing about uh jordan lynch he was actually on the dan patrick show dan patrick asked him if you got picked up by an nfl team and they said we want you to play running back what would you tell him he goes you know what? I'd try the quarterback position first because I'm a quarterback. If that doesn't work, sure, I'll do whatever I need to. I mean, we just saw in the Jacksonville versus the Texans game we were all watching, Denard Robinson's out there. He's running back. I mean, they ran out of options. Basically, everyone's getting hurt, having cramps up. They put Denard Robinson out there, former quarterback. Anything is possible. But, I mean, with the Texans, just going back to them, one of the names, other than Wade Phillips, because right now he's kind of in the driver's seat, one of the names that everyone has kind of seemed to go to, and we all know him because he was here in Chicago, Lovey Smith. He's the front runner name of the fans, of the media, of everyone. Oh, Lovey, he's a perfect fit in Houston. Perfect fit, no, because Houston was the everything they have right now is not fit to run the cover two system that Lovey Smith has kind of been known for and been used and has used so effectively. So I, I wouldn't say that. And then there's also the issue of, once again, I got to say it, what's the issue in Houston offense? What did Lovey Smith get fired in Chicago for? Not being able to produce an effective offense. Why you would get Lovey Smith, I have no idea, because the defense is going to be fine. Nothing will be different about the defense. Just leave it alone. Don't touch it. You need somebody who can get in there, command that offense, and get that working in the right direction. So you're saying go offensive coach more. So does that mean Wade Phillips is not fighting to be the Houston head coach because he's more defensive than offensive No, I, in your I mind? would leave Wade Phillips where he is. Unless you can bring in some, I don't know, unless you have some weird situation where you have a great offensive coordinator who doesn't mind just being an offensive coordinator, but I don't even like that idea. Get your head coach to be offensive-minded. And I mean, Houston can go with, right now, if you're Houston... Like you said, it's great that they're starting the search now, but you can go anywhere. First off, we don't even know how many coaches are going to get fired by the end of this year. You have college to go to because now once the college season is done right now, we've seen it. USC's getting head coaches. People are moving from Washington, Boise State, everywhere. There's got to be someone that wants to make the jump to the NFL and also, look at the Bears. You can even go to the CFL and get a guy if you want. Although that one's panning out. Yeah. It's only it's only the first year. Give them give them a little bit of time. Yeah. Rome wasn't built in a day. I that's that's very true. But I will say uh, the biggest complaint I know I had and a lot of other people had too was the lack of consistent NFL experience. I, I just you know. I'm so just if you're Houston, do you want that consistent NFL experience? I think but right now you see a lot of frustration in Chicago, so I would say why not go for some NFL experience? That's what you want, first of all. I mean, I guess if you can't get it, sure, go somewhere else. Probably college before the CFL, but... And this is there's been rumors about uh, Nick Saban going to the Texas Longhorns. Do you think He's that... Gonna, maybe you he think goes the to Texans, Texas. If you were the Texans, do you try it? Do you try to convince Nick Saban to, hey, if you're going to leave... LMM anyways, come back to the NFL. Why not? I mean, and it's an interesting position because why would Nick Saban ever leave Alabama? Because they lost the Iron Bowl. Ha, 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 laugh, laugh real. Yeah, right here. pretty much. It's, it's dumb. Uh, there's no reason for him to leave. He's basically built up a dynasty. It's so powerful. Everybody wants to go play for Alabama. Why would you leave that? Yeah, the NFL, 
it's it's pretty tempting. You can get some good money playing or coaching in the NFL. But I don't know. If I'm Nick Saban, I'm not going to Texas. I think it's that drive to get rid of that one smudge on his record. Pretty much it's like, uh, what does he still have left to do at Alabama? Well, I've done everything there's. What haven't I done? Oh, yeah, be great in the NFL. And we watched Pete Carroll transition from bad NFL coach to great NCAA coach and then back to the NFL, and he's having such great success with Russell Wilson and this defense he yeah, built up was, through the draft. That was a right fit. If they don't get, if he doesn't draft Russell Wilson, difference. It's just a good fit on top of his coaching. Exactly. And we're looking at a Texans team where you basically get to come in and pick your own quarterback. I think that that's a very tempting option. And the one thing I would think of is I don't see Nick Saban as this guy, but I would be a little. I don't know if I want to say uneasy or nervous, but what if uh, he takes Nick's, his quarterback? He takes his guy, AJ McCarron. Yeah. Would you be comfortable with that as a Houston Texan fan? Well, let's see how many pick sixes has AJ McCarron thrown this year. Yeah, but the college talent's different than the NFL talent. He's playing in the SEC. It's not that different. I would not want AJ McCarron to be my uh, first round pick. I would, no, no, he's I not a first really round pick. I wouldn't really want him to be second round pick either. No, I'm saying at get all in the, in the draft. If I can get him in the third round as like the second quarterback that we've taken, RG three Kirk Cousins style, I'm completely fine with it. The only issue you do sh- uh, have is a little, if there's going to be a little bit of favoritism because Saban coming from yeah. Alabama has coached him. And that might be a selling point if that happens. But, I mean, last thing I want to throw out about this, what about Kubiak? We've talked about Houston, where they're going to go. What's next for uh, Gary? Gary Kubiak has pretty much always been the head coach of the Texans, if you think about it. He's been with them since David Carr, I think. So it'll be strange to not see him on the sidelines. But I think he's, I think he's still an okay head coach. It was just you've been there too long. You get stale. And you don't have the same impact and effect on the team anymore. I think he needs to start fresh with a different team. I'm not quite sure where he's going to land. I'm hoping he stays in the NFL. But obviously there will be more job openings in college football. I didn't even think about that. And you brought it up. Kubiak, only head coaching job, Houston, has been there since 06. It's true. Although we have seen him off the sidelines for a little bit due to health injuries. Um, Now I think... It's an interesting position because you want to you got to ask the question is Gary Kubiak going to be willing to not be a head coach next season? Is he going to be willing to just be a defensive coordinator? I don't know the answer to that question. I don't really want to make a guess either. Well, and like it also at this point it's kind of hard because I mean we don't know what NFL jobs are going to open up. Yeah, exactly. I mean plus there was a huge amount of NFL jobs that just got replaced last season. So you would assume there should be less uh, new offers because obviously head coaches, you know, you're going to want to give them more than one year. Yeah, but at the same time, the only three that I can see that were not, and two, some of these might be shocking, but the only three teams that I could see for right now, if you were like, Ricky, they're going to fire the head coach, I'd be like, I believe it. Washington, Atlanta, Tampa. And the Jets. I didn't think about the Jets because they're not three in garbage. Really? Because they're, they're five fucking terrible. Yeah, they're they're awful. The Jets pretty much have a defensive coordinator pretending to be a head coach. He's just ignored his offense the last couple of years, and you can clearly see the impact it has. So it sounds kind of familiar when you look at the Texans. You know, they end up lucking into Arian Foster's undrafted free agent. I mean, obviously you have Andre Johnson out there, but they've really just ignored a lot of needs growing over time on that offense. And the most you know, visible one is quarterback. So I think that there's just some eerie similarities there, and uh, Rex Ryan probably still going to lose his job too. So overall, very last thing I'll ask about Houston and Kubiak. Houston moving forward, does it depend? It depends on who they hire as their head coach, but do you see them coming back to where they were as a playoff team anytime soon? Yeah, I do. Um, I would give it, probably two seasons just because you want that rookie quarterback to kind of get into the job and ease into it. It might take a season, but I think there's still going to be a good team. Uh, When it comes to the AFC South, obviously Indianapolis can kind of dominate for a little bit. 
And I think that's going to be something that kind of pushes the Houston Texans back for just a couple seasons. Yeah, the only reason I think I'm with you here is you can't guarantee a one-season turnaround is because there isn't that standout quarterback like a Russell Wilson, like a Andrew Luck, like an RG3, who has that just instant impact to just take a team to the next level just by showing up day one. Different, different team. So before you chop my head off, Dave, I'm just going to throw out there. So let me tell you how you're stupid. Kansas City Chiefs. They bring in a new head coach, new quarterback. I know the quarterback's and not a rookie. And they play a bunch of shit teams. But yeah, they they had... oh, what's going to happen to Houston's schedule next year? They'll get to play some shit yeah. teams too. Some. Do you know how amazing that schedule is this year for the Kansas City Chiefs? Yeah, Houston's going to have a similar like schedule because they're so bad. Houston just lost to the goddamn Jaguars. You can't get much easier of a schedule than that. Yeah, well, no, they have to play the Jaguars. They're in their division, Dave. I know. Yeah, they played twice <laughs> and they lost twice. That that would be my point. Is if you can't beat the Jaguars now, twice. Let, let's, let's, let's put a cooldown on a rookie quarterback coming in and learning the Here's system. The oh no, thing. I'm not Half saying that the a rookie quarterback's going to come in. The Jaguars have are against the Texans. Damn. <laughs> I'm not saying a rookie quarterback's going to come in. I know that Alex. You look at Alex Smith and. Kansas yeah. City, you get Alex Complete, Smith? completely Damn. different than a rookie quarterback. Alex Smith had one of the highest happen. completion percentages as a quarterback. Oh, I know. He's a good quarterback. He has one of the best touchdown interception ratios as a quarterback. People's only knock on him was, yeah, he can't complete the deep ball. Well, guess what? He can move the ball up and down the field. Yeah. He has great running backs behind him, and the system works. You have to work around your quarterback. You can't just be like, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna pick up Geno Smith, and we're going to throw the deep ball, except we don't have wide receivers. We're going to rely on the running. Oh, wait, we don't have a running back. Yeah, it, it shows <laughs> when you try to do your own thing and ignore what your quarterback can and can't do. Well, now to move from the world of football to the world of baseball. Usually we don't talk a, uh, a lot about baseball, but we've got some big news. Robinson Cano, no longer a Yankee. Going to the Mariners. Committing careers and stat suicide. He goes to a hitter's, just hitter's nightmare. Like, this is where hitters go to die. Well, I mean, I don't know. Seattle, to me, the last great hitter I remember being in Seattle was Junior. Yeah, yeah. Years well, ago. If you count A-Rod. All right, now, now imagine the free agents that came in there. Richie Sexton. I think he started off hitting, what, 280, oh. 285, maybe, maybe, maybe 290 at one point. Then drops back down to, what, 230, and then he disappeared. You also have Adrian Beltre. He goes he goes from hitting 330 to, like, 250. And, oh, wait, 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 let's leave Seattle. Let's hit 310 again. Yeah. Just like that. Flip a switch. The Mariners just have a horrible park for hitters. It is a pitcher's park. And the town itself, I'm sorry, Seattle, you're a dreary town. It's wet. It's cold. It's not an appealing town. So, yeah, you go out and sign the big name. Guess what? He's going to come there. He's going to hit 290. It's pretty well, pretty pedestrian for this Robinson is, Cano. This is what I don't understand about it, and it goes with the whole 10-year deal thing. Oh, yeah. that's obviously, Has, obviously has he idiotic. not learned anything from, one, a guy who's been on his team for the better part of a decade in A-Rod, but yeah. also Albert Pujols goes out west, 10-year deal. Crap the first year. Oh, no. This Hamilton, was entirely based on money. Hamilton goes out west. Crap. If anyone in baseball actually cared about winning, they wouldn't be doing this contract bullshit. That's the thing. It's like, it's oh, 240 highest, million. Who wants to give me the most money? Yeah, I'll play for your team. I, I like this uh, for the Yankees because yeah. they get rid of this. They don't have to worry about, you know, spending 200 million, possibly 240 million. And you get a guy like Jacoby Ellsbury to come over from Boston. Exactly. It's a, yeah. I, it, it's an all right pickup. It it works out. I mean, you're not wasting the money in the years, though. They need to go out and use that. You're right. They need to reallocate those funds that they were going to throw at Robinson Cano, go out, get themselves some pitching, and fill out that defense. You still are missing maybe a third baseman there, and obviously you got to fill in for second. Exactly. Uh it gives you the ability to do that now. And you got, you know, obviously the Mariners now. Ten-year deal for a guy who is 31 years old. Who's going to be 41 if he ever reaches the end of this well, deal. Yeah, first if off, he's not traded every, before Everyone then. here knows, I think we're all in agreement that these ten-year deals are absolutely suicide for your contract. It's just we're going to throw the most money at you so we get you here for the prime of your career so we can pull fans. So we can hope that you can just leech on to those good years for a couple of years and help us. Well, the way I see it is, and this is 
I see it the same as like in hockey, the seventeen year deals, the twenty it's like why? Why do we need to be giving any athlete, no matter what sport, decade long contracts? Yeah, they they obviously should limit those down. And I think that contracts I think the MLB problem is just the salary cap and how garbage this the whole setup with salaries is in the MLB. It, it makes zero sense and it's hurting organizations. And I mean, I'm looking at this roster for the Yankees, or not for the Yankees, for the Mariners. If you add Cano to this roster, besides Felix Hernandez, what the fuck do they have to work with? Nothing. Nothing. They have Cano and King Felix. And get, guess what they have behind King Felix as far as pitching goes? Nothing. Yeah. It's... What they should have done with that money? Go out and get pitching. What do we just see? We saw Boston get rid of top name talent. And go out and get themselves some pitching and some younger players. Hey, guess what? We're going to win a World Series. Cardinals, what do they do? Get rid of Pujols. Yeah, let's go out and, you know, another deep trip into the playoffs. No problem. Get rid of David Freeze. I guarantee you they'll be fine next year because pitching is the key these days. It's not the steroid era. You can't get, like, a couple sluggers and just have them carry you through the entire playoffs. It is a pitching-centered league now. Teams just need to forget that, okay, big name may equal a couple more people showing up to these games. But if you want to win, you got to go for pitching. Well, it's funny that you bring that up, Dave, because, I mean, earlier in the week we had the Nationals and the Tigers make a trade where the Nationals acquired pitcher Doug Fister from the Tigers. And then we had the Tigers later in the week go ahead and sign reliever Joe Nathan. So I think right there the Tigers understand that, hey, maybe Fister, we didn't need a starter Bringing in a reliever, it's all about pitching. And the Nationals, they need pitching because their star might need Tommy Johns. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this, this is kind of like an insurance policy. I mean, you don't really want to call it an insurance policy because he's going to contribute. He's going to do good things. Uh, obviously, going 14-9 and nine, uh, last season, that's that's pretty good. You're going to be happy with that. Um, obviously, you know, you would like a few more. Nine wins aren't going to be something our nine losses aren't something you're thrilled about but whatever so i think this one really is the insurance policy on strasburg they're nervous this was the guy who was you know gonna sell seats you know dave was talking about how so much of baseball is dependent on selling those seats and getting that money back to your club those tv contracts are huge you gotta have the right numbers exactly so this is kind of all right maybe he's gonna get hurt and we're gonna lose viewers now we got this new guy we got doug fister now, this is the guy who can sell those jerseys, he can sell seats, and he can get people watching Nationals baseball again. Well, I think with the Nationals, I don't think their problem is filling the seats because I still feel like even though they are a year or two removed from that World Series run, they're still an up-and-coming team. They're still a popular you mean, team. You mean them pulling out of the World Series yes. run by being pitches? pulling out by sitting Strasburg being bitches they're still popular they still have I don't (laughs) care how you want to describe him Bryce Harper he's a viral machine people love him the internet eats him up and now they had Fister you look at their starting rotation Strasburg Zimmerman Gio Gonzalez who comes over from Oakland and then decides to be good Uh, yes he didn't have a lot to work with in Oakland Dave yeah I realize that but now, you, ball over there. but now you add Doug Fister to this already huh. really good rotation. You just remind me of something funny. I was thinking Billy Bean could fill out like three, four rosters just off of that one contract. <laughs> you have one Robinson Cano contract. You have like four athletics teams. You could. So, you could have four money balls. You know what this does well? This actually kind of gives you the ability to not use Strasburg as much in the regular season. So maybe he doesn't need to pitch the 210 innings. Exactly, and he can last and be there for you if you get into the playoffs. And then, you know, you don't have to they have a scary. Pi- you're right. They have a scary pitching rotation that can go deep into the playoffs. Uh, they're definitely a team that can be reckoned with. Well, let me just, uh, let's not dance around the question. With this trade, does this affect how far they're going to go, and how far do you see them going next season in the playoffs? Absolutely. This way, like I said, insurance policy for their pitching staff. So they have three great, uh, sorry, three very good starters, even if an injury occurs to one of them. I think it's a fantastic plan, and, yeah, it definitely buys them another round in the playoffs. I agree. It definitely will 
Plus, I mean, Detroit obviously were just involved. They were a team, you know, basically two years in a row are in discussion for can they go to the World Series. Now you just take a pitcher from that team, put him on a team that needs a couple more pieces to get back into that conversation. Mm -hmm. This helps out the Nationals so much. How far then do you, I'm just going to, since you were the one to say it's going to help them, how far in the playoffs do you think they can get with this trade? Does it get them to just in the playoffs or maybe like an NLCS, a World Series berth? Honestly, if you get all your pitchers doing so well, you can. there's no reason why you can't get to the World Series. If you can shut down other teams with every single starter you have, you have no problems. What about on the other side? And I'm going to... This kind of relates a little bit more to you guys because you guys see the Tigers more often in the regular season than my team does, being White Sox fans. Tigers, they trade away Prince Fielder. Yes, they got Ian Kinsler. Now they're trading away Doug Fister. Yes, they signed Joe Nathan. But with these moves, with the Tigers, you guys knowing the division well, with this and a new manager and Brad Osmus, what do you see from the Tigers coming into 2014? I see the Tigers being a well-run organization. Mostly because you see them as a team that has, I mean, far and away taken this division over. There, There's nobody even close. So I think they can afford to get rid of Fister to get some value back on some younger guys to try to fill out that roster, try to balance it down. And that's the same thing. Like the Kinsler trade, I didn't, I, I cast that as breaking even. I didn't see a You huge, traded power for speed, basically. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't a great uh, bump one way or the other. But this way, I mean, they lost a three-pitcher, and they picked up uh, some talented youngsters. So I think it's a good trade for them. I think they can afford to lose one to two wins in the regular season. I mean, they could even lose seven or eight. It wouldn't really matter in our division. Yeah, and I mean, in that trade, those youngsters that you're talking about, they got infielder Steve Lombardozzi, left-hander Ian Kroll, and minor league lefty Robbie Ray were all three of those names. I'm looking at it going, they're young. I don't know who they are. I'm not familiar with them as a person looking outside of the National Nationals organization. But right there, you had an infielder and two pitching and two lefties. Lefties are, uh, I would say they're a little bit rare to find good lefties in the MLB. Uh, it's always a priority, just for matchup's sake. You always want lefties to go in there. But no, I think, it, I, again, I really believe that they're taking the right direction with this. They have the ability to make these moves and get rid of some big names and get the payoff in future years. So, smart move by, I think it's win-win. I think this is one of the few win-win trades. Well, and guys, now to move over to the city of Chicago, the beautiful city that we're in. The White Sox did make a move this week. They re-signed a player, a team captain, in fact, in Paul Canerco, who will return for his 16th season, one year, $2.5 million. Yeah, I like it. Uh, I'm glad to have Paul Canerco here. Pretty much, I don't want to see him anywhere else, and apparently he wasn't ready to retire. So give him another year. Uh, he can give you some decent play, but mostly he is just a guy to have in the locker room supporting the team. See, and the one thing, and this is what I've been hearing from just random Sox fans that I deal with in my everyday life. There have been some that have said, why not just retire? Yeah. What do you guys have to say to that? Yeah, he probably should retire, but he's not willing to make that uh, choice yet. And I don't know. I, I like him just being in the locker room, even if he's not going to be you know, the Paul Canerico that he was years ago when he's in his prime. He's kind of fizzling out a little bit, but I can give him one more year. It's not like the White Sox are competing for anything anyways. True. It's not like the Tigers aren't making moves that make you guys feel like you guys can take the division back, right? Exactly. We want to keep around the good personnel in the locker room, but it's not going to cost us a ton because only about half of that $2.5 million contract is guaranteed. A lot of it is based off of mm -hmm. performance bonuses. So it doesn't really hurt us too much to sign them. And... I think that it's good to have his influence around, especially around this younger locker room that the White Sox are trying to build up and trying to really mold into a new team. Well, guys, and now to move over to basketball, we have the Bulls. We're not going to really talk about the Bulls because I'm just going to say they suck. But the Houston Rockets looking to trade former Chicago Bull, Omira Sheik. The Bulls did just beat the Heat, though. By 20. Yeah, let's remember that. 
but let's also we remember lost it's a... to the Jazz. Okay. The okay. Jazz. We beat the Heat. That's can, all that can matters. We, can we Season's sell this? Okay. We beat the Heat in the regular season. Nobody gives a shit. We're still LeBron not. was yeah, picking his nose two. on we're, the bench laughing. It's something to be happy about. It's false hope, people. Don't believe it. Smile, everybody. We beat the Heat. But the Rockets looking to trade Omira Sheik, and they're looking to uh, get this decision done. They're saying in between the 15th and 19th, which would be between a week from Sunday to a week from Thursday. Well, yeah, they want to sell high right now. He's doing fairly well. They don't want to risk really him kind of falling back or anything like that. Get the most you can out of this guy. It doesn't make sense to have somebody who could go start somewhere else just sitting on your bench not doing much. Yeah, he's putting up good numbers, but I don't think you're really going to be hurt that much from the loss of a Sheik. So, yeah, you get Kevin McHale who right away when they get Dwight Howard, like, oh, yeah, this is going to be great. We got a big man head coach. We got two bigs. We're going to run this big physical down low post game. And then uh, everybody's like, no, nah, it's not going to work. Dwight's going to complain. Dwight complains. Omer wants out. This is all before the regular season even started. Mm-hmm. And then guess what? They try it out, and they find out, well, it's not the best system. You got to play to your strengths. You got Harden on the outside. You got Lynn. You got shooters. Chandler, Paris. I mean, you just got shooters on the outside. So you got to... You can't be slowed down by having a second big on the court dragging behind when this transition game is so quick. So I'm not really surprised by it. I'm kind of surprised it took this long. See, but the one thing I think of, first off, why the hell are you complaining? You guys are 13-7 and seven right now, which is better than all but two teams in the Eastern Conference. Because they're in the Western Conference, and that is mediocre. So, so, so just... Be happy that you're 13 and Mediocre. 7. Also, once you get to the playoffs, I bet you there's a lot of teams that wish they had two quality bigs that could be starters once you get to the playoffs. Yeah, it, it really does help out, especially because Dwight, you know, you don't know if any injury is going to pop back up on his back or anything. So it it seems like it would be a great thing to have. But if they can find some good value for him, I'm all for it. I'd like to see Omer start somewhere. What team do you what team do you see wanting a Sheik at, at all? Because me, I'm looking at teams where teams might go, okay, it's Omira Sheik. I mean, what really? Who has the best value to even throw at them? Maybe Minnesota, maybe L.A., the Lakers. I think you can put a big in the Lakers, and uh, you get something interesting. I don't. They don't really have anything to give, though. That's the problem. Is the Lakers really have absolutely nothing to offer? I think it'd be an interesting addition to their team, but no, it's hard to say where exactly they're targeting right now. I haven't really heard any rumors as far as a Sheik's landing spot, but I will be absolutely interested to hear and follow the story. Uh, me too, because I mean, since he left, I I hated to see a Sheik go as a Bulls fan, but I was not willing to pay him that much money. But we watched him go as one year as a starter on the Rockets and put up a double double average. And be like, okay, this guy's a legit center in the NBA. Okay. So, I'm going to throw out a hypothetical. Would you rather see Omira Sheik than Boozer on the Bulls? Have Noah Gibson a Sheik? Well, considering a Sheik's salary would have been about half of what Boozer's is, yeah, yeah, I would have dealt with that. Even with his free throw percentage? But the fact that a Sheik is a center brick. and Boozer's a power forward... Yeah, but you could have... What? Do you want Noah and him on the floor? No. Two goofy, uncoordinated dudes? No, you dudes? have no. Noah and Ashik rotate the center, Taj at the power forward. But then we, we lose Noah, who's basically our, you know, our all-star. He's our consistent guy out there. Then you put... When he, could Noah, be an idiot, Noah's, Ricky. Noah's going to need a rest at some time. Yeah, he will. But that's what we got old retired players for on the bench mob to replace him. Okay, okay. I'm just saying I hated to see Ashik go. I agree. I'd love to see him back. But I like the fact that he's a starter, and I think he deserves to be a starter in the NBA. So moving over to the big news in the world of college football, USC has hired Steve Sarkeesian to be their new head coach, which kind of uh, upset Orgeron a little bit. Just well, a little no bit. shit. Somebody thought he was going to get that job, and I guess not. And now he is moving away. He's parting ways with USC. He wants nothing to do with them now for the rest of 
Well, the bowl season. But but really, was it uh, was it that bad of a move, Dave? No, it was a smart move, and I applaud USC for making the correct decision, not just playing on. Oh well, Ed Orgeron did pretty well this season once he took over. We should give him more games. No, no, that's crap. So they end up picking up Steve Sarkeesian, absolutely great head coach, smart guy. He turned around the Washington program, and I think he's the perfect guy to bring into USC. What we've already seen was Ed Orgeron pulled out some decent talent and actually kind of gave him a preview of, okay, these are the guys you get to work with. So now Steve Sarkeesian can go and recruit the top-level guys now that he's the college in California. Well, I guess like 1 and 1A now that Stanford has kind of reclaimed some of their old uh, swagger. But still, he has a much larger base of players. He can pull in these four-star recruits absolutely no problem. I think it's a great move by USC, and I absolutely think that Washington handled it correctly. They went out. Let's go ahead and pick ourselves up a new head coach from Boise. Well, and it's funny because the last team they saw in 2012 and the first team team they saw in 2013, Boise State. Yeah, I actually like uh, Peterson leaving Boise State. It's a little sad since he was constantly the guy who's saying, no, I'm going to stay here, but he's done a great job there. Of course, you know, it's kind of tapering off a little bit. But it's nice to see him go somewhere else where he can do other things. I wouldn't say tapering off. It's that Boise State, Boise State, when we first knew who Chris Peterson was, they were what NIU is today. NIU is the new Boise State, if you like it or not. Yeah, without the much. sweet jerseys and the blue field, the yeah, Smurf turf. If only there was a nice Smurf cardinal turf? field out there. That would look beautiful. There is? There is in East Washington, yeah, D2. We, do we care about D2 schools? No. But it's a sweet... I want to see them and Boise State come together for a scarlet so, and so blue... So we have a red-blue game? A red-blue game. Yeah. Like half the field is red, <laughs> half the field blue. Yeah. Red versus blue, let's go. But then you can't switch sides. you got to stay on your side. Right, right. But I mean, since he took over Peterson at Boise State, 13-0, and 10-3, and 12-1, and 14-0, and 12-1, and 12-1, and 11-2, his worst season this last year, 8-4, and four. But that was in the third season in the Mountain West Conference. And he comes into a loaded team at Washington. So I think it's just perfect. I, I think this move, uh, another everybody wins week for Dave. Another everybody wins week. Well, one thing I want to bring up, just because his team's actually playing this week, you have Gary Pinkle in Mizzou coming out today and saying, hey, guys, don't even look at me. I'm staying here at Mizzou. What do you guys think about this this little saying? I mean, yeah, we've seen Chip Kelly say, yeah, I'm staying and then move. But do you think Gary Pinkle will stay with Mizzou? Maybe he's really hoping for that NFL job. He's trying to pull the Chip Kelly. But, no, I think uh, essentially, yeah, I think he's going to stay at Mizzou. Mizzou just moved to the SEC. They're competing well. I think he wants to kind of become the, one of the powerhouses of the SEC. Did anyone see the Tigers being this good in nope. their second year in the SEC? No, absolutely no, not. Without a doubt. Moving from, they went five, like, if you look at the two teams in this SEC championship, one was two and six in their first year in the conference. The other had no conference wins. Yeah, and I, I think Mizzou impressed a lot of people. A lot of people thought, hey, they might even be able to go undefeated. Obviously, that's not happening now, but they still were so impressive, and it's going to be interesting to watch them in the future in still, the SEC. Still have a shot at that title game. Maybe, maybe. No, not really. You're saying if they, if oh, they, if win, Ohio State yeah, loses, if they and lose, blah, blah, they blah, still blah, have blah. a shot. I'm saying at the at the title game. Yeah, it's not going to happen. But no, I mean, it's, it's know, FSU. It's Ohio mathematically State. possible. Yep. Mathematically, they're still in it. They're not like the uh, Baltimore Orioles, who it used to be. Hey, we're mathematically eliminated. The season just started, but and now they actually made the playoffs. So they what you did do now. Well, now it's the Mets. Now it you is. move to a different team. It could be the Cubs. If we're talking baseball. Well, I mean, when yeah, isn't it, it the it Cubs? Is. Let's be honest. <laughs> Every year. <laughs> yay, well said. Opening, yay, opening day, and now we're done. But that's going to do it for the Onside Kick. As always, like us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash the Onside Kick. Hit us up on Twitter. Follow us. Shoot us a tweet at Onside Kick Real. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Like our Like our videos. Comment down below. And as always, have a good day, everybody.